Hello there, I'm Bob Champion. Used to be a jockey many years ago and was very fortunate. I rode for Josh Gifford, a stable jockey. And as you all know, I went and won the Grand National on Alden Eighty. I was brought up in Yorkshire and um, I suppose I was always going to ride. Dad was a professional huntsman. Uh, I can always remember the first time I got on a horse and um, pony actually. And um, Dad was always very forceful. I'd been riding it for about 10 minutes and he decided it was time I started jumping. And I still remember him pulling out this ladder, chasing me over it. Uh, I managed to jump the ladder, fell off the other side, and I didn't think that was the game for me. me. And um, thankfully, Dad kept away and uh, the whipperins, Dave Anker and uh, Margaret, were the ones that got me riding, really. And um, I suppose I really got interested when I was about nine. And, um, you know, used to go um, show, well, not show jump, bit of show jumping, a bit of a Jim Carner's most of things, a lot of hunting. And um, I didn't like jumping to begin with. I can always remember. I thought it was dangerous. And um, I used to get somebody to jump the pony over the fences out hunting for the first months. And I got wired in one day and I was with a whipper in and I had a decent pony, and if I wasn't going to jump this five-barred gate, and I can still remember the whipper in turning around and um, going back a hundred yards, and turned in, and the pony followed him, and I jumped the five-barred gate. That was me hooked. I promise you, I turned around and jumped it both ways again. And from that day, I was fanatical about jumping, I must admit. And, you know, we used to do gym carners and everything. I was very lazy, I didn't like putting tack on horse ponies, so I rode bareback all the time. And I think that was real grounding. And up the north those days, the Jim Carners had um, bareback show jumping, bareback Jim Carners. And I thought that was a great help, I must admit. And I remember a leather broke one day at um, Y in a three mile novice chase going to the first. And I rode round and won, you know, made all. So. Um, and I didn't think anything about it, you know, I was just used to it and um, I enjoyed riding bareback only because I didn't like cleaning tack. I left home on my 15th birthday and moved south. Um, being from the northeast, there was no real job, well there was jobs up there. I didn't want to work down the mines, Skinny Grove mines, uh, five miles under the North Sea that used to cave in once a week and kill a few people. or Dorman Long Steelworks and I wasn't really into that as well and so I moved down to a farm in Wiltshire who had a couple of pointer pointers so I worked on the farm and you know rode the pointer pointers out and um, went to evening classes local tech did an engineering course I was quite good at that actually but what a waste of a lot of evenings because I never used it again and I can always remember I had my first point-to-point -point ride on a horse called Home Court at Lark Hill and um, I had a chance going to the last and I promise you I knocked it on the ground actually. <laughs> if I'd been more sensible I'd have jumped it and most likely won but no I was stupid and um, but thankfully I rode the horse a week later at the point-to-point -point and that won and that was me hooked. I rode quite a few um, point of points for the next well two seasons I did point of pointing um, rode and I was a man called John Daniels who used to ride for Lucy Jones who had some really good point of pointers got injured and they asked me to ride him so I rode some nice point of pointers um, for those two years but wanted to be a professional jockey so ended up going to Toby Baldings and um, great experience I loved it there I must admit and I can always remember the first day there um, they pulled out a horse just coming off grass and um, legged me up it reared over on top of me on the concrete and broke my leg so that was my first three minutes in a yard and I thought oh my god so went into hospital had it all plastered up came back and I thought, well, there's a lot of apprentices in the yard, you know, you've got to do something. 
So I got the blacksmith to make me a big stirrup iron. And I rode out in that for three days, you know, and um, never realised the doctor rode out on Saturdays. So that put pay to that. So um, Toby gave me um, jobs to do in the yard and they made me gallops man, actually. And I wasn't a bad gallops man, I must admit, even if I say it myself. So all the two years I was there, um, I was gallops man in the afternoon as well. So um, I liked my gallops actually, enjoyed having them looking really good. Got myself fit to ride and the country went down with foot and mouth. And um, so about three or four months, wasn't it? It was a long time. And, you know, Toby, we had to keep go the horses on the move because nobody knew when the first day we'd be back. We were only going to get like two days warning. And, um, you know, trainers was three, year, three, day, uh, three week entries those days. So basically trainers had to keep entering them up every three weeks just in case it started and um, I can remember the first day back it was at Plumpton and um, had my first ride back there was a horse called altercation in the yard and um, nobody wanted to ride it not even me even I wasn't stupid it had run seven times and fell seven times and um, Toby said you're riding it like it or not a novice chase at um, Plumpton. I was still an amateur those days and um, went to Plumpton. It must have been about 250 to 1. It stood up and won and I thought I was God's gift to racing, I promise you. But I rode it twice more, it fell twice more, so I wasn't quite as good as I thought I was. That was my first winner under rules, yeah. I'd rode about quite a few. I must have ridden about eight or nine point-to-point -point winners. And um, so that was my first, and I was still an amateur. And um, so I got to eight winners. I was lucky, I rode eight winners in about five weeks, I think it was. And um, I suppose an amateur, and I was seven pounds as amateur races. But funny enough, I never rode, only rode one amateur race winner, actually. But I suppose my seven pound was useful. And um, I can remember got to my eighth winner. Those days you had to have an A permit and a B permit. To get your B permit, you had to go for your B permit after you'd ridden eight winners, so to the 10. And I um, still remember going up to Portman Square and um, thinking um, things aren't going well in this interview, you know, I'm going to come out with nothing, which I did. And, um, so I didn't have a license or anything and um, oh, they were awkward as stewards those days and um, had to apply while well, Toby was fuming and because I didn't realise he'd backed me to be champion amateur and um, he was fuming and um, it took, must have taken me six weeks to get a professional licence and um, so it wasn't very pleasant I must admit had to go, funny enough, had to come to Craven meeting um, the jockey club here to have an interview um, to get it again, you know, and they managed to give me it. And I went to a lovely little track called Y in um, Kent. It's, no, it doesn't exist anymore. And um, my first ride back is horse called Sailor's Collar. Um, my first ride. Um, he went and won. So my first ride as a professional won. Um, had a ride, a couple of rides the next two days and um, the next one was third and then the um, next day I rode a winner again and so came back and um, I had six rides the next day coming booked and Toby saw a ridden my second winner so that brought it to 10 all he said to me is you're not riding again this season I want you for your claim next season so oh great you know um, so I suppose it was I suppose another six or seven weeks before the end of the season couldn't ride and um, had a bit of a holiday went back to Toby's and the same place 
different horse, I broke my other leg. And this was a worse break, I promise you. And um, so here we go again, back in plaster and um, back on my tractor. And um, so basically I didn't start again till about January time, January, February. And um, had the um, five pounds allowance what Toby wanted and I rode um, quite a lot of, well, I rode uh, 15 winners that season, but um, in a very short time. And um, I can remember um, a horse called Highland Wedding. Um, I won the ID chase on him as a claiming lad. I think he was about my 16th or 17th winner. And um, I did ride him his first race to come back. And um, then Eddie Harty rode him and won Nottingham. Um, I got on him and won the Ida Chase on him. Then Eddie got back on him in the National. And then, um, then he ran in the Midland, first Midland National. And Eddie didn't want to go there particularly. I had to go there. and. I can still remember that day, um, it was this weekend actually, um, going up there and, um, you know, we knew the horse was over the top, the owners had come from America, they'd missed him at Liverpool and, um, and you know, you always know when he's over the top, he was free, he, was, he wasn't the same horse, I pulled him off after two miles, it's the only time I've ever really been really booed off a track and a police escort. I can still remember it. I was at Utoxa to the weekend and I still remember it. That police escort off. Couldn't wait to get out of the place. Um, but, you know, I had a good season, rode the 15 winners and um, without any more breaks. And, um, you know, I was very fortunate. Um, but then I'd lost my claim. You know, those days it was only 25 winners till you lost your claim. So, um, things got hard and um, I had um, terrible season. I rode eight winners, I think, that's all. And I can always remember Eddie saying to me, Eddie was a brilliant man for me. I appreciate everything he did for me, actually still do. He was a fantastic horseman. I wish I was as good as him. He really rode for Ireland in the Olympics and um, a fantastic man. And he told me, he said, you're not going to go anywhere here now because I'm stable jockey. I'm going to take everything as any good, which he should do. And he said, you know, you've lost your claim. You better move out. And um, and he said, um, Paul Cole's got two or three jumpers. Go and school them. You'll ride them. And um, did that. And um, I can remember I was looking through you know, train local trainers and everything. And I had um, two or three rides lined up for the beginning of the season. David Ellsworth, um, a horse called Lucky Tango, um, he wanted me to ride in novice chases and she won her first four, so I was very lucky. And um, Patrick Haslam had just started training and I rode a horse called Squiffy, she won quite a few races. And um, that's how it all started. But I thought, I've got to get somewhere to ride out. And I, a man down the road, who's the man that got me going, I must admit, a man called Monty Stevens. He was a self-made man, bought a farm and built Swindon. And then he bought a place called Lucknam Park near Bath. And um, may turn that into a training establishment. Uh, it's a big hotel complex now. and. Um, I just said, oh, could I come and ride out? And he said, of course you can. And he offered me a retainer the next day. So um, that's how it all started. He had majority of hurdlers and um, had some nice flat horses. But for me, he was a genius because we hardly had any gallops. He was a terrific feeder. I think that was his key. And, um, you know, the longest gallop we had was four furlongs and it wasn't very steep either. And, um, well, it's no steeper than walking up those stairs, you know, but, um, but fantastic. And, um, and he used to run them and, um, and he had, I suppose, had about a 
seven or eight jumpers and the rest were flat horses, about 35 flat horses. And um, But, you know, he was a great man. And I can remember always to this day, the second day I rode out there, he invited me to have breakfast with him. I think he just liked to have somebody to chat to over breakfast. And um, walking in, and I'd always ask the lads and the girls in the yard, what's Monty's interests? And um, they all said, every one of them said pigeon racing. Well, I knew nothing about pigeon racing, I promise you. And I'm from the north. And uh, I can remember going in the second day and seeing these pigeons flying around and not and one or two weren't going in the coop. And I'm sat down having breakfast with him and um, nothing's much said. And I come up with this cracker. I said, Governor, when I came in, I saw this pigeon flying around, not wanting to go in the coop. And to this day, I can still remember him getting up from the kitchen table, walking outside, come back in, picked up the 12 ball, went back out, bang, and um, came in, put the tag in the clock and said, that should have about won, you better do the same this afternoon. <laughs> so I went and wrote a winner for him. But I did say to him the next day, you know, Governor, why did you get rid of that pigeon? All he said to me, they're no damn good if they don't come back in the coop, they don't win races, and most of all, they teach the others bad habits. So there was method in his madness, let's be honest. Um, but he was a great man, and um, I rode for him for about 18 months, and um, sadly he died of cancer, so I was without a job. But I did have a second retainer with Miss Oriel Sinclair to ride her chasers which was going quite well. And I did that for about eight, about two years, I suppose. And uh, didn't have that many chases I, I was riding for, but they, were, they won, let's be honest. She, she was a maestro. And then Josh Gifford, well, sadly, Dougie Barrett got killed. And um, Josh had been without a jockey for a season or two, and things weren't going right. and. Thankfully, he asked me to ride for him, and um, well, he, he gave me a ride, let's be honest, before he asked me to ride. Uh, he was trying a few people out, and I rode a horse for him at Boxing Day at um, Kempton in the novice chase there, a mare called Claire Dawn, who was owned by Tony Grantham, the royal jockey, retired, and, um, and it had fallen a few times, and um, so it was a good novice chase. There's only three of us in, but two good horses and mine, you know, mine ended up a decent horse, but and I remember there was John Frankham and Jeff King and myself and we got down to the start and we said, whatever happens, we're not going to go quick. The only time we start racing is after we jump the second last. So we toodle around all three of us for a mile and three quarters and um, jump the sec second last, all three of us upside. We're going a hundred miles an hour all three of us to the last. The speed we were going, something had to turn over. Who was it? Me. And I can remember lying on the ground, thinking of excuses, to be honest. What I'm going to say to Josh, give it first ride for ex-champion jockey. Looks like he'd be a fantastic trainer. And um, I'm lying on the ground. And um, next thing, he's standing above me with a horse in his hand. And he said to me, do you mind getting on this horse and cantering by the post for the um, third prize money? And uh, legged me up. But the thing I admire about him, he asked if I was all right before. Uh, most of them would have thrown me on with a broken neck, but he did ask if I was all right. Um, can't have done as well as I thought I had, because he never asked me to ride anything for um, a couple of months, I suppose it was. And, um, and I was riding quite a bit for Ken Condal and a few people. I was riding quite a lot of winners. And um, I can remember it's Chepstow, um, one of the, their big meeting there. And um, I was riding one for Ken Condal, a good horse called Orosio. He'd won the Cesarowicz and he was um, one of Peter Harris's first horses in training. And he's been a fantastic owner ever since and trained himself and everything. And um, and I can always remember, um, you know, Orosio. Um, he was a funny individual, but, um, you know, he helped get me going, you know. But um, 
and then you know I was, he was leading me out uh, lead Josh always lead, used to lead his horses out those days so I was going out in a Rocio Josh was leading his own horse out and um, he said Bob where'd you go tomorrow I said oh Windsor he said come and ride one for me then he said, um, how do you think you'll run? I said, I'll win. He said, no, 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 his would win. I said, I'll have a 25 quid on with you. Mine finishes in front of yours. Mine won and his was second. I got me 25 quid as well and um, went to Windsor and rode this horse called Captain Hardy. Um, never, it always pulled up. I don't know what um, was wrong with him and um, I hadn't sat on him before and for some unknown reason it won and um, and there was 27 runners and so it couldn't have been a bad race you know and um, and I won quite nicely and um, that got me the job at Finden and the horse never got round another course pulled up every other time so there must have been something internally wrong with him but he was the horse that got me going and you know from those days it was had a fantastic innings you know for Josh then and um, the horses Josh went out and he had he'd taken over Ryan Price's old horses and they were at the end of their tether and the captain had gone to the flat and um, so Josh was a terrific buyer and Althea of young horses and they bought some lovely young horses for the next season and that was brilliant you know and rode some really good horses for them and um, Josh had a f brilliant way of training everything everything he had was relaxed he'd have had about 40 something or other the most he ever had when I was there was 56 and we you know we got with 80 winners some se seasons you know uh, very few didn't win um, he didn't keep horses with no ability you know and um, which is the best thing you know best for the owners and everything um, terrific way of training horses always relax they all funny I look back a few months ago my record with him and I think um, my record was something like one in four of all my rides for Josh won nine out of ten horses were on the track first time out won over hurdles and we didn't have there was no bumpers those days and it was nine out of ten novice chasers won first time and they weren't over schooled Josh didn't like over school because if they're we always felt that you know if they're too bold you want him to just look at the first two and um, I think that was the key and Josh always wanted me to be positive over the first two and he says that after that they'll jump out of your hands and he was right you know being a brilliant jockey himself and um, but we he bought jumpers nice sort of jumpers and um, and you know I was very fortunate and rode some good horses you know approaching one first time over hurdles Kaibo one you know all those good horses we had one first time out on the track and um, and then first time over fences always you know and um, I was lucky to have the job, it was, a lot of them were steering jobs. <laughs> John Frankham, the best I've ever seen, still. He was such a superb horseman, absolutely, horses all jumped for him. And John, I promise you, could see a stride from when he landed the fence before. He was that good, but there again, he was junior European show jumping champion, so he knew exactly about strides, and John, to me, and I haven't seen anybody do it since. John had things sorted out 30 strides before the fence. And so he'd made corrections then, because when he was going to fence, he was always going forward. And he was phenomenal. I, never, I can't remember him ever seeing him fall at the last on anything. And, um, but it, out in the country, horses were jumping nicely out of his hands. Um, never doing anything silly, you know, he's phenomenal. Of course he had the odd fall, not like every jockey, but um, had very few. Judge of pace, unbelievable. Everything about him, horse is always relaxed and, um, you know, he proved it. The proof is in the pudding, isn't it? And, um, you know, he had the best job in the country, Fred Winter, 
um, took over for Richard Pittman and um, you know he was fantastic jockey and I still remember him winning the champion hurdle on Sea Pigeon one of the best rides I've ever seen um, I also did, hardly got the trip at Cheltenham and um, I think he was the only sea, only champion hurdle Sea Pigeon won I think and he still took a pull halfway up the running to get another breather into him uh, how many jockeys would have done that you know Phenomenal he was and great person. I went racing with him quite a lot and, um, you know, very funny and everything. And um, But when he got to the race, got us in a race, he was professional and the best. We used to travel a lot together, all of us, you know, because I lived in the Lambourne area. And um, if I was going north, I'd uh, meet up with Bob Davis, who I sat with all through my career. Um, Bob Davis, Jim Wilson, great amateur, and Jeff King, Johnny Hayne. You know, we all used to go together, Vic Zone. You know, John, we might meet up with John, but John used to drive Fred Winter a lot. So, and um, so, the, the, you know, we, we always had a car load. We um, always said we'll meet at the Pheasant, uh, that's just outside Lambourne and at a certain time and if you're there we'll all jump in cars if you're not we're going you know and that's how it worked out and we weren't ringing one another round you know we knew what time we'd be there and um, if you're not there you're going on your own type of thing so it worked out well and um, you know those days um, you, you those days you had to go in the bar after whatever people say um, my job John's, everybody, the stable jockey, had to go and have a drink with the owners, and which they're paying, and which should happen, I think. And, um, you know, when I used to get off a horse, Josh, last one I rode for Josh today, would say, see you in the bar. It didn't mean, would you like to go to the bar? It meant, we'll see you in the bar. And um, if you had a ride for somebody else, it would be after that, you know, but see you in the bar, that was it, you know, and... You know, things have changed. We, those days, we always had to go racing in a suit or a blazer. And, you know, if you'd ridden out, you know, take it with you. And um, But the thing was, see you in the bar. And I think the owners deserve that in a way, because they put a lot in racing. And um, they like to chat to the jockeys about, you know, how the race went or about any of the other horses in the yard or anything. You know, it's. I think it was a very important part of the job. I won... Um, Ida Chase, SGB Chases, Black and White Chases, um, SGB Hurdles. Ascot was very lucky to me. I think I rode every, rode a lot of winners at Ascot. Loved riding there. Um, never, I never had to think about a race because Josh never gave orders. And, um, you know, I just used to do it at Ascot. I don't know why, I just didn't think, it just happened. Um, you know, Josh's orders would be, I'd walk in the paddock and um, Josh would say, Bob and I have spoken about the race, what are you doing? Well, we hadn't spoken about it and I'd, I'd say what I was thinking I might be doing and that was it, but that didn't mean I was doing it, it was just Josh made you ride the horse as the race was run, really. If no gallop, you know, might suit you, might not. If there's no gallop, the horse wants a, a, st a stare, you know, you'd go and make it or something or other, so... Um, he was the easiest person to ride for. A lot of those trainers, those days that had ridden, were very easy to ride for. Because um, they knew what happens and everything changes. And I suppose those days you really, you did get fairly, really good run races. But they didn't go f f too fast early. The f last part of the race was always the quickest. Now it's completely reversed. And, um, and, you know, it was always big fields, you know, um, and big fields, you know. I was always riding in 30 runner novice hurdles and, um, and round little tracks. There were always big fields, there was a lot of horses, but there wasn't as much racing those days, you know. There used to be a meeting in the north, a meeting in the south, and maybe one in the Midlands. And um, so the jockeys, funny enough, um, didn't mix, well, southern jockeys and northern jockeys those days, and, you know, John Joe, Ron Barry, and Stacky and all them were all champion jockeys. From the north, there were some big powerhouses up there. 
and you know John and then and um, you know now the jockeys race all over the country but we never did you know um, we might the only time we used to see one another is on a Tuesday at Leicester or Nottingham type of thing and um, I worked out and you know I was pretty high in the list usually about third or fourth in the list and um, I worked it out the other day I only had um, 29 rides in my whole career above Weatherby and about, about 16 winners I had only had five rides at Air, one at Perth, one at Carlisle, one at Teesside, four rides at Catrick, um, Weatherby, five rides. And why would you put that down there? Was it the train or why? No, because you basically southern and northern trainers, they didn't travel them as far, you know, so, um, um, you know, it was amazing. I only had three rides at Market Raisin, you know, but all my rides were Sandown, Ascot, Newbury, um, Cheltenham, all the, the bigger tracks, and your Devon and Exeters, Newton Abbots, and Wing Cantons. Um, the odd ride at Fakenham, Huntingdon, quite a lot of rides, and because Josh came from Huntingdon, who was brought up and born there, so um, um, so we had quite a lot of runners there. And his brother lived there, and parents, and everything, so. Um, I was lucky at Huntingdon, but you know, we might have runners at Leicester, a novice chase at Leicester, and on a Monday or something. But um, things were like that those days. But now the jockeys are everywhere, trainers everywhere. Mind you, the roads are better now too. Didn't have that many rides there. Funny enough, I was third, in the third, fourth, and fifth in the Gold Cup. But Alden Eighty was um, third. Um, then um, approaching was fourth. And um, I think one for Peter Cotton, I forget its name, was fifth. So I had, I was, I did have a ride for the Irish, and uh, I forget who it was for. It might have been Mick O'Toole or somebody, but it was called Fort Fox. And um, I was travelling really well, um, top of the hill, and I got brought down. Um, he might have won, he might not have, but you know, it was too far out. But. Um, so I had you know, a few rides in the Gold Cup, and um, um, but that's it. The I was, you know, in the Nov Sun Alliance. I was placed, you know, in both chases, and um, I'd, I got beat. Um, I got beat a neck on one in the Joe Coral, and um, and that's about it. Really, didn't have that many rides. I had the odd ride in the Triumph, but. Rudlock win winners at Charlton the other meetings. It wasn't just it was just funny, you know. But Josh didn't run much at Charlton because that if they weren't good enough to go there, they didn't go there. Why go there and waste a race when they could um, go to anywhere else and win a little race? And so we didn't have that many social. Well, Josh used to call them social runners, and um, you know. You want to go to the festival with a chance, really. Um, well, he did, and a lot of people did those days, and um, there was always a massive amount of runners there, you know. I can remember one year, I think the Triumph Hurdle had, I think, 90 declared overnight, you know. So they had to ballot, well, ballot it out by handicap. If you hadn't won two, you didn't get in. And that was for 30 runners, you know. You don't get 30 runners in any race at Cheltenham now. And the novice herders were the same, you know, it was, there were so many jumpers about. The old Aniti story um, started at Ascot Sales. And um, David Barons, who trains flat horses up the north, um, didn't, doesn't have jumpers, didn't have jumpers. They bred him and they sent him to Ascot Sales. And, um, you know, as David said, um, he, he made what 4,008, I think it was. Um, that paid for him a bit more land, actually, up north. So, um, so he extended the farm a bit and these training facilities, and he was only interested in the flat. So, so Josh went to Ascot Sales with his father-in-law, and um, who used to go. He was a really good judge, Althea's father, uh, great show jumpers, you know, Roger Smiths, you know, and. Um, so 
this horse walking round and um, Josh had looked at him, of course he had, and um, liked him as an individual and he got to about 4,000 and um, Josh's father-in-law, Josh was pulling out and digged him in the ribs, have another one, have another one, this is a racehorse, this is a racehorse. And um, so Josh got him for 4.8, I think it was. And, um, and Josh used to buy quite a few, few young horses on spec and everything and sell them or try to sell them after. Well, he couldn't sell all the needy. And um, so we went to Ascot with him. Josh always ran his horses on a good track, usually a group one track, and they all used to go and win, didn't they? And a great selling point. And um, so Alden Eighty um, won there, beat the Queen Mother's horse, a really good horse. And um, so we beat him. And um, so Josh could have sell him about five times that night. And um, the Embricoses were the first person to ring Josh. And, um, and Mrs. Embricos was a steward there that day, so she'd seen him, so they rang him that night, and there was no mobile phones then, and um, bought him. So that was the start of him, and um, so he won there, and um, then I went back to um, Ascot again with a £10 penalty, and the horse that finished second to me turned it round, which is fair enough. He was a pretty good both horses were decent horses and then we went to Cheltenham the festival and I was third in this Sun Alliance on him and that was him for the season then he um, came out in a handicap at Sandown and broke down so that was him the first setback um, then we decided you know he'd have to go chasing the next season um, went to Ascot and no, I went to Newbury and I fell off him at the second last actually. He did, did make a mistake, but uh, I fell off him at the second last. Um, so he went to Ascot and he, um, I remember the day because it was, um, was the national meeting and I had to come back from Aintree um, to ride to. Uh, Two or three for Josh, uh, two for Josh, and one for forget who it was for. Um, oh, Ken Cundall, and that one, both of them won anyway. So, um, so it was a good trip back actually. And so he won there, and then he um, had a couple more runs um, and won a couple, and then turned away and came back, broke down again, and um, so another time out and um, then he came back after that and um, he, after a long lay out lay off he ran in the King George first run after two years and um, finished fifth and you know that was a good run really I suppose um, Gay Spartan won it and um, and I wasn't beaten too far but far enough <laughs> then we ran him at Wing Canton he hated the track. I never, and he ran bad. Really, did run bad. And um, then the next run was the Gold Cup, and um, Josh said to me because I'd been riding a horse called Strombolus, and I'd won three on him off the bounce. And um, Josh said, if you want to ride Strombolus, you can put. We'll put somebody else on Alderney. I said, no, no, no. I'm stable jockey. I'm riding Alderney. Thankfully, I did. I finished third. And um, so then, then he went from there um, to the Scottish National and finished second. Scottish National wasn't very long after, you know, about two weeks. And um, then he, um, there you go then. Then 10 days later he went to Haydock and he won there. And, um, and then he went to Utoxeter and won the final of something or other. So he had a busy season that season. And um, after that, rest and um, came back and um, what did he do then? No, before that, uh, for the, uh, um, the Hennessy, I can always remember, he um, 
uh, landed on the back of a horse at the second fence and k virtually came down and broke his bone his hock and um, but I s couldn't pull him up because he used to pull so hard and I finished third in the Hennessy on him and then he was crippled and he was out the other season so um, he he was always injured and um, then he had then I was out with my cancer and he ran once and Richard Rowe rode him. He broke down there and broke down badly and um, I was there that day but and the vets told the Embrikos to put him down. He was that bad. And um, and Mrs Embrikos said, Bob's always said this horse would win a Grand National one day. So we'll take him home, plaster him up and that's it, you know. But if I hadn't said, I'd always said he'd win a national, because I suppose I had a good feeling, because I'd won on Highland Wedding before he won a national. I won the very first uh, rag trades, first run over fences, I won on him at Haskell. So I think it's a good idea. And um, so that's what kept him alive. Uh, but you've got to admire the Embrikos' first lead, but the old horse. He was in plaster six months in plaster, tied up, couldn't lay down, couldn't walk anywhere. All he could do is eat food out of his manger for six months. He would have sent anything crackers. Well, he would have sent me crackers anyway. And um, so after the six months, um, he was let out and, um, and he was sound and the Embrikoses always did the road work themselves. So they did a couple of months road work and did a lot of road work with him. And he remember, he came back to Josh's January the 1st, 1981. Um, so good start, you know, and um, 13th of February, um, he um, went to Ascot, the Whitbread trial, and then now he'd been off another 18 months or more, you know, and um, absolutely bolted up. Um, but I can always remember the weights had come out for the national that morning, so the weights couldn't go up. Josh had been quite clever in things like that, you know, and um, so he wouldn't, didn't even get a penalty. And um, so I can, you know, basically, um, but the best thing about it, um, the betting for the national was 66 to one that morning, and he was 16 to one for the Whitbread trial that day. And um, a few people I know had a right few quid on it, especially the owners, and um, um, the 66s and the 12 to one, duly obliged. As he went by the post, they made him 12 to one second favor of the national from 66s. That's how impressive he was. Uh, went up to Liverpool and we were lucky again in a way because um, Sussex um, the day um, on the Wednesday before the National and their horse was, uh, wasn't going to go up till Friday um, went down with foot and mouth there was an outbreak of foot and mouth and Josh got a phone call at one o'clock in the morning from the chief of police saying, you've got to get that horse out by five o'clock in the morning or you've, he's stuck here. So the police must have backed him. And um, so Josh got on phone to the traveling head lad and they got the way or horse away by 4.30 in the morning. So he was up there two days early, but, um, but you know, if it wasn't for the police, I wouldn't have won a national leave and I wouldn't have been there. I thought it was a certainty. Josh has never known me so confident in my life. I just thought it was a formality. What a stupid thing to do, you know. I just thought, you know, formality. Can't, couldn't see him getting beaten and um, I can even remember, you know, I rode him out in the morning and the day before as well. A hack and he was never been so relaxed in his life. I was beginning to worry, you know, he was just so relaxed. Uh, good sign, really. And um, I rode him out and um, I remember went back to the hotel and uh, popped in the sauna for 
take a pound off and loosen me up really. And Josh insisted we had a bottle of champagne before we went <laughs> to celebrate, win, lose or draw. So we had a couple of glasses of champagne, went to the races and um, did all the TV, press, radio interviews. But I was just relaxed, you know, just unbelievable. And, you know, going down there, no orders and um, got down to the start. And I still remember getting down to the start and Josh was there. God knows why he was there, get away from the owners, I think. Couldn't stand the pressure, I suppose. And um, and I always remember him saying, you know, um, you know, take it, he just said, take your time, you know, which I always rode him, because he used to pull very hard. So just all he said was, take your time. And um, with luck, take it up. There was fear, take your time, with luck, take it up, going to the last. And, um, but, so I said, you know, I said, do me a favour, Governor. I said, because Josh used to smoke. And I mean, one after another. If I win today, will you give up smoking? He said, if you win today, I'll definitely give up smoking. And he did. Um, from that day onwards, then he took, took up cigars after that. But cigarettes were out. Never smoked another one since. But um, so he had willpower as well. But the race didn't well it went all right to begin with you know I overjumped the first nearly went and um, the second he stood too far back and landed on top of it a little bit and that was the makings of him and from that moment it was a joy to ride and um, I remember I jumped beaches about 29th and must have had the best run around the canal turn than any jockey's ever had in the history of the race because Val three fences later which is valentine's i jumped to the front and i'm thinking the bollocking i'm getting in the stands from the governor you start better start thinking of excuses so i jump a fence and think of oh how red rums won his nationals and then i look beside and i thought um rub stick um won it a couple of years before every fence till I went out in the country again, I was thinking of excuses. And then jumped the first going away from the stands and thought, I'm here now, enjoy it. And, and that was it, you know, I jumped for fun. And um, I never, I always thought I was beating Philip Blacker. And I dad took a look at him at the third last, and knew I was going better than him. I tracked John Thorne to Beecher's and he must have made a mistake there or something. He did make a mistake, I think, and I lost him. So I thought those were two changes. And it wasn't until I pulled up, I realized I'd beaten Spartan Missile, um, which, you know, a fantastic gentleman. You know, he was great man for the sport, great man for the game, owner, breeder, everything about it. And that old horse used to go better for him than anybody else. And, good jockeys rode him after. John Frank and Hugh Davis and them, they never got a tune out of him like John Thorne. It was amazing. The, his two daughters got a better tune out of him, Di and Jane, you know, but just funny, you know. I suppose they were the only ones that ever rode him or from the day he was born. I think, you know, they just knew him inside out. And um, so, you know, went by the post and, um, I can always remember thinking, Christ, I've done it, you know, and um, didn't know what had finished second or anything. Came back in. I'm, I think the jockeys miss out on that walk back to the old weighing room. You know, that was a fantastic walk. They haven't got that now. He's straight off the course into the inside enclosure. They miss that walk between the police horses. I think that was something I remember more about the National than anything and all the crowds around you. Um, I can remember that day because I did, you know, won the national, did all the TV, press, radio interviews, nearly forgot I did a ride an hour later, and one Josh really fancy, got beat on that, so I got a rollicking anyway. He brought me down to earth very quickly, I must admit. Um, well, I think it was the most sensible thing to do by him, actually, but um, Lord Grey's idea it was to make the film when they decided to do it and asked me if I would mind or anything. And um, I said, no, I was quite honored actually, I must admit. And um, so 
I did a lot with a scriptwriter. I didn't know who was going to play me then or anything. We did, and um, the scriptwriter. I did. That's the most I did with the film. Really, I did every day. I spoke to the scriptwriter and saw him and things for two or three weeks. You know, and um, then they came to actors and Steve McQueen is dead, so I couldn't have him. So. Um, so they had John Hurt, and I was delighted, John, to be honest, because I've all, I always admired him. Um, what an actor, you know, the parts he'd played. And also, he was great mates with Terry Biddlecombe. And Terry was a brilliant help, and he was advisor on the film, and helped John, because John did a lot of riding in the film. Um, didn't do any of the jumping, but um, most of the jumping was done by John Burke who won it on rag trade because he was the same size and looked a bit like uh, John. And um, so basically, Berkey did a lot of it and um, so made it more realistic. And, um, and the filming, that was unbelievable. How they, they designed two of the fences that would open just like that and let the Land Rover go through with the cameras on. And before the horses got there, shut. Rams, you know, it was amazing. Um, the technology that went into it. Um, couldn't believe it all. You know, it would be open and it was shut before the horses or vice versa. Oh, it was absolutely amazing um, what they can do. And um, so, you know, I felt relieved about it. And um, till, you know, when you're watching films, they don't start the making films they don't start at the beginning end at the end and all that jazz you know they film a bit here film a bit there you haven't got a clue what's um and john hurt said to me don't go and look at the rushes he said let me mix you up he said i don't even bother he said um wait till it's finished and um, i can remember when it was finished and lord grade rang me up come and have a look at the film um with me so that we had a big theater of me and him watching it and the first version was about two and two hours 30 minutes or something or other and um he came up and he said we can't make it we can't we've got material for the two but two and a half hours but he said yeah those days you had to have a break and he said it would ruin the film if you had a toilet break so they cut it down back to the longest they could do it without, by law, whatever it was, and I think that was the most sensible thing he did. And um, and then, like the music, it was unbelievable. Carl Davis and you know what a writer and every film score written by him was always the tops, and so he did that. And both Shirley Bassey and Elaine Page did signals for it, and. Um, so that was interesting and then the um, premiere, um, you know, I did all the promotion really for them because John was busy filming and he did little bits but um, he was always working and um, so I was one hauled in to do that and, um, but it was a royal premiere so, um, which was nice, the majority of the royal family were there actually but they love racing don't they but um, I'd finished, um, what a, I can remember my third ride, I never, I brought, brought a no hope in my first two rides. Um, then I rode in the, the best ride ever in the National, I keep thinking, was um, the Chris Red Rum National. I rode, of course, a horse called Hurricane Rock. He was one of the outsiders. And um, I, I jumped the last third and finished about fifth, so, um, you know, that was tremendous, you know, um, for me anyway, I felt absolutely fantastic, you know, and I can remember speaking to, I think it was Ken White halfway round and um, I said, I could see, we could see Chris Miles away and, um, and Ken, I said, Ken, Jesus, he said, don't worry, it'll stop. And um, when I pulled up and Ken was, finished whereabouts I felt finished and um, uh, I said yeah you're right Kenny he did stop but he took a bloody long time about it didn't he um, um, 
Um, so that was, then I was um, like, I was fifth, I think I was fifth on him, fifth, fifth on one of Josh's Manicou Bay. Um, what else was I placed on? Um, Arika Rock, Manicou Bay, Spit and Image. No, not Spit and Image. Uh, um, money Market and one other. Um, after the National, one season, um, my weight had gone. I was struggling and I wasn't getting the rides I was before. You know, I was getting old and there was younger lads in the yard. You, Josh couldn't just kick them out and it was the best thing. And I got out, um, I went to Cheltenham and I got beat ahead. No, and then a length in the coral. Um, so that was my last ride at festival and went up to Weatherby and um, went on the Friday, I finished third in a novice chase and then I was called Lumin, won the handicap hurdle up there and as I went by the post, I thought that's the time to retire. And there was two reasons in it really. My weight, you know, I, I was always gonna wait to the day I wanted to retire, but. Um, the main reason was weather being it was in Yorkshire and that was the thing that made my mind up if it hadn't been in Yorkshire maybe I'd have ridden another week or something or other but because it was in Yorkshire that was it and um, as soon as I went by the post my mind was made up and um, come back in told Josh I've finished goodbye <laughs> oh he was happy I went out and win it you know um, you know, he was, he'd been great, he'd stood by me all the time, so, you know, I've always admired him for that. Um, um, you know, I got out my own terms and I was happy to do it, so. And then I trained a few years and trained a few winners and um, enjoyed it, but, enjoyed it but didn't enjoy it away, you know. It's different, you know, and Plus, the Cancer Trust had come along, that was taking up more of my time, so I had to choose one or the other, and I did, we did pull off a touch at the Listo Festival, that meant more to me than anything. Um, what a crack that was, you know, and, um, and funny enough, it was um, Adrian Maguire's first winner at Listo, and he was born just up the road, you know, so, that meant an awful lot to him as well. Um, yeah, he was, Major wrote a few winners for me. I was, you know, um, lucky. You know, he was a great jockey he was, but you know, I, a lot of good, good riders rode winners for me, but um, you know, Brendan Powell and Hugh Davis and Dom Woody, um, hell of a lot, you know, um, but Tony Dobbin, um, some good, really good riders. I was very fortunate, road winners for me. But, um, you know, the Cancer Trust came number one in my mind. And, you know, training, you've got to be 100% there all the time. And, um, you know, doing all the other things I did, it wasn't fair and, um, and my place wasn't big enough either for many more horses. And well, I was too busy as a jockey, you know, because I rode out seven days a week, every week, even through the summer, you know, and um, so you didn't get a lot of time. Ah, we used to used to play a bit of squash and live in the sauna as usual and um, play, I play a little bit of golf now badly. Um, but, you know, the interest, I still go racing quite a bit. And, I had five days last week, four days at Cheltenham, one day at Utoxeter. Um, new market will soon be starting. And I do love flat racing, I must admit. And um, I love seeing the two year olds in the paddock walking around and picking one out I like. Maybe it'll turn out no good. But, you know, and following it or following a, the winner of a two-year-old race at Newmarket. I like to see how they progress and um, hopefully one will turn out a classic winner and I can think I like that once upon a time. I suppose take every day as it comes is the, the best bit of advice and um, you have a bad day, never give up. And 
and I had a few of those, but um, I think that's the best advice, never give up and there's always light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs>